so I'm Eric Boyd. Um, I've uh, worked, uh, as stated, within the, the, the CTO's office, also within network services as well. So I'm kind of covering both here, I guess. Um, let me get started here on the slide deck. I plugged in the, um, the video, because I'm act the audio, because I'm actually going to do a couple little snippets of video as we go through here that are, uh, that are hopefully helpful uh, and give a little bit more of the community context behind Internet 2. Um, you know, Internet 2 is you. It's the people in this room. It's the people in rooms like this around the country. Um, and uh, Internet 2 has been around, I think, since 96, I guess, the score, the score of keeping goes. So it's been around for a while. Um, and uh, um, it's a, a, a very thriving and vibrant community that continues to evolve. Um, certainly has in the decade that I've been there. Um, so what I want to talk today about is uh, building the next U.S. innovation pro platform. This is not just an Internet 2 effort. This is at the regional networks and the campus networks, throughout the whole RNE community with our international collaborators as well. Um, and uh, so this is one of the fancy slides they put together, uh, sort of to, just to symbolize, you know, why are we doing all the stuff that we're doing with networks that we're doing today? And, and it's really about enabling the science, enabling the applications, the arts and the humanities, and really transforming how people communicate, how data is shared, and, and, and what we can do with it. Um, and, and, and that leads both to you know, the academic pursuit of new knowledge, but it also leads to um, you know, new commercial endeavors, new companies that really transform and shape our economy and, and enable us to continue to be one of the driving forces around the world in terms of new innovation. So to start with, I was going to give uh, or play a little video that we had uh, put together for our fall member meeting. It's real short. Um, just sort of give a little bit of the innovation story, and then I'm going to talk through it a little bit. And as I go further into the talk, I'll get a little more technical for those of you who are more interested in as that aspect as well. Um, so forgive me. Hopefully this will work here. When the best innovation is taking place, the core focus isn't short-term gain, the immediate commercial viability of an idea, but liberating intellect to solve practical, far-reaching problems that benefit society. In the research and education community, innovation starts with an idea that travels, engages, grows, and develops without constraints. It's a different kind of thinking that lays the foundation for entirely new ideas by liberating the smartest people in the world to be able to connect the dots in a way they've never been connected before. We want business models that encourage use. We want to remove barriers to innovation. If universities constrain networks, innovations like Google Search, Facebook, or Box probably wouldn't exist in the world today. When we equip lots of really smart people with really great technology, and no barriers, that's when they start creating the future. Unhindered collaboration, absolutely no barriers. It's a community where ideas are shared and new technologies are built. The community has touched nearly every major innovation that defines our modern digital lives, and we continue to define what's next, influencing governments, commerce, science, sports, education, news, and medicine. This kind of transformative, disruptive innovation has a history of being spawned in the research and education community. Earth-changing innovations like the internet, text messaging and society impacting breakthroughs in life and physical sciences. The Internet2 community is responsible for many of the great technology innovations of our time, including the internet itself. This came out of researchers, educators and policy leaders working in a lab and university setting. Innovation and excellence from scientific collaboration with community-developed technologies. This work can only continue if the best minds are sharing the best information with colleagues, whether they're next door, across the country, or increasingly around the world. As a member institution in the Internet2 community, we have access to the most advanced 100 gigabit optical network available on the planet along with enabling applications and unified solutions that just aren't available anywhere else. Internet2 brought real solutions, advanced networking and application technology, ensuring that our campus had the capacity to connect with our peers. 
Our community extends beyond creating economies of scale. We scale to create economies, improve standards of living, and enhance the global society. Our smaller planet is being transformed, and this transformation is coming from our community and relying on our technology. We solve the most pressing problems of our global society through advances in teaching and learning and scientific research that combine to unleash new global discoveries. Unconstrained collaboration by an unparalleled community with unprecedented technologies. That's when you invent the future. That's Internet 2. So let me see if I can switch back here. So the techie in me says, you know, that's a lot of marketing. Um, why, why, why am I showing that here? But I think the important reason that, that there is an important part of this story that took me a while to figure out is, you know, if you look at some of the situations we've had around the country, uh, Wisconsin comes to mind in particular. Um, you know, the benefits of what we're doing here, while we may be, while I may be preaching to the choir a little bit in this audience. Um, is not necessarily well understood beyond the r &E community. So it's as important to make sure that we have a common vision within the community in terms of how we're going to facilitate innovation so that we can work together in a coherent way that, that leads to that innovation, but also externally so folks understand why they're funding the r &E community as a driver of innovation that will lead to those next generation uh, of, t of, of technology companies around which you know, our, our economy is built. So what I wanted to kind of go through today is sort of, you know, sort of a little bit about the backstory about innovation. You know, what, what did we do in the past to have it? Um, what's enabling innovation today? Um, and what is the new innovation platform going forward? And then how does the role of schools here in California uh, and elsewhere around the country really contribute into that so that we create a coherent environment? Um, I remember a year or so ago, I think, um, you know, uh, Dave Lambert, the, the CEO for Internet2, was saying something to the effect of, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, if you count up the number of engineers we have in the R&E community, um, you know, we outnumber the biggest ones. We outnumber the Cisco's and the like. And so, you know, our impact has been as big or bigger than any one of those companies. But, um, you know, sometimes we go off in all the different directions. So how do we find ways to, to keep that independence, to work on our own projects, and yet have the collective effect be far greater than one of those Fortune 500 companies in terms of transforming the next generation of the internet. So a little bit about the past, and then we'll get into the present and the future going forward. Um, so if you look back, um, the the RE community played a seminal role in the creation of the modern internet. We all know that here, um, and the applications that came out of the RE community have made it a extremely transformative technology. Um, and, and that sort of led up to the commercialization of the, of the internet in the early 90s, and then you know, the response to that was sort of creating the Internet 2 community in, in 96 going forward by some of the leading universities here in this room. Um, so that's sort of where it came from. And if you look at the return on investment, the, you know, the, the total 30-year federal investment, I think, was like less than $250 million. Um, over the course of 30 years. And yet, you look at the total contribution to the U.S. economy, it's now $684 billion annually, or about 5% of all economic activity as of 2010. And you know, the value of the whole internet to the U.S. economy um, is probably on the order of $1.4 trillion annually. So this little graphic just sort of shows, you know, for the investment that we made, how much of an impact it had. So again, this is maybe preaching to the choir here, but in terms of our ability to sell the story of what the r and &E community is doing, we need to have the tools and, and the language available to us to explain that innovation story, to show how much of the, the current economy was built on what we've done, uh, many of you who were there, and then how we need to continue to do that investment to have this going forward. Um, and, you know, so, those early seminal investments, they put the r and &E community way out in front of the commercial markets. It created a new bandwidth-rich playing field, and it enabled those innovations that led to the global transformation. So if you think about it, the next part I'm getting to is, is what do we want to do going forward? How do we recreate that environment for innovation? Uh, this is one of my favorite slides because it's from my alma mater. But um, the, um, you know, the key takeaway, I think, is that many information technologies that we're familiar with today have their roots on university campuses. You know, personal Ethernet services 
uh, were created created massive campus innovation test beds. You know, when the commercial carriers were still offering dial-up service and fighting the internet technology vision, the campuses were the ones driving it ahead. You know, if you think back and you put on your 1995 hat and you think about talking to your local ISP, they probably would, you know, if you said something to them like, I want to do this and this and this, they would have said the internet, that's for getting your email. It's not really for anything else. Why would you need it? And any year after that, if you go to your ISP, they probably would have said the same thing. What you're buying from us today is all you'll ever need until next year, of course, when the RE community has led the way again. So we need to continue to do that. Um, if you look at sort of where the birth of the commercial internet came from, I mean, look at, you know, so this, here it's being shown in the form of browsers, but how many of these came out of the r and &E community? You know, I mean, if it wasn't for these early developments, all the things that we take for granted today wouldn't be there. Um, you know, some, some of the, uh, you know, early arguments were that, um, you know, it, the internet can't scale, uh, the packet networks won't be as reliable as circuit networks, but despite all those arguments, the r and &E community was the one that pushed through and what it advocated for became the de facto standard. If you look at many of the U.S. major companies, where did they come from? They came off of our university campuses and they still continue to do so. Um, you know, the, the one that resonates the most for me is a simple way to explain it to folks outside of our community's Facebook. You know, when when you had 56K dial up into the home, the idea that someone would be streaming pictures over your internet constantly and creating something like Facebook was unimaginable. And yet, um, and yet uh, once it was proved viable, then there was a drive to upgrade the, the, the bandwidth into the home. So you know, it's that kind of transformation. It was that ubiquitous bandwidth to the dorm room pillow that wasn't there to the home that allowed these companies to th sort of thrive in the campus ecosystem prove that, the, you know, because our campus ecosystem is made up of 20-year-olds who are willing to try new things, who want the latest stuff, and if they have a lot more bandwidth, there's enough of them that you can actually prove the commercial viability of, an, of, a, of a new technology and then roll it out to the larger community as a whole. So that's a little bit of sort of the, the advocacy for why it is important to continue to have this innovation cycle, why, the, you know, how the r and &E community has continue to be a leader in that and why we need to continue to do so. Um, and, and, and even the companies that are sort of the established thought leaders have, you know, they benefit from us pushing them as well. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this later in the talk, but we've had a lot of interaction, much more than I can remember in the 10 years I've been in the internet too, with some of the major vendors in the past year basically saying, no, that's not good enough. We need more. We need more. And it's been fascinating watching them try to respond and really listening for the first time I can remember in a long time in terms of how they've responded and trying, trying to change the technology because they know with things like OpenFlow and software-defined networking coming at them that the whole ecosystem that it seemed relatively stable to them for a long time is changing and changing quickly. So the innovation story is going to continue. What the r and &E community does today is setting the, the groundwork for the next stages of internet development and is enabling the economy that our children will see in the next generation. So a little bit of an observation um, about our past and the future. You know, one way to think about this is there's sort of three eras. There was sort of, and you can characterize these eras in bandwidth. There was sort of up to the 100 meg uh, uh, era where we had browsers and search and chat and video and VoIP. You know, then there was kind of this uh, era of about 100 meg to 10 gig when innovation sort of slowed and the R&E community focused much more on business um, and, um, you know, just sort of, you know, uh, what's the most efficient way we can offer the services. And look, the, the amount of sort of innovative new internet technology seems to have de declined somewhat in that area. You know, there's uncompressed video, large data exchange, but it was more about aggregation, cost savings, efficiency, and competition. But going forward, you know, we're up into the the terabit range, you know, so we've got SDN, we've got big data, but what else will be the themes of this era if you gave this talk 10 years from now? Sort of, it's sort of one thing to be thinking about as we're going forward. So the, you know, the r &E community still plays a critical role. We must continue to lead the paradigm shift, and we have to continue to enable game-changing applications, and we have to continue to create new markets by building new networks and applications that advance the state of the arc. And we must continue to create and influence tomorrow's user and consumer base. 
So I'm going to break out of the talk again here for a little bit. I wanted to show you, um, we've done a couple use cases of what campuses are starting to look like, look at in terms of innovation. Um, and I thought these might be useful for folks. Again, part of this is maybe interesting to you, but also part of this is starting to create the, um, the, the, the words and the, and the material needed to start making the story at our state legislatures and the like that you know, funding innovation is a key driver. You know, it, by, by funding the r and &E community, you're driving the economies of the future. So this is a short case study from Clemson. Internet 2's roots are in innovation. It, it, it came from a, a need for um, technology to support innovation within the university community. We're living in exciting times now in that there are all these new concepts coming at us like cloud computing, uh, the need for, uh, the, the pervasive need across all disciplines for support for data intensive science. With the tools that are being developed, some being developed right here at Clemson, some things we're trying to do, and with the internet too and the platforms that are available, think about it, instead of getting through 10 books on the Civil War, every book ever written on the Civil War then you can use the computer to at least work like a research assistant. Campuses can't do everything they need to do to support research, uh, research communities going forward. The research communities are not tied to geographical boundaries. They're, they're, they're in a sense, at least national, if not international. We continue to foster these new um, these new collaborations between us and other institutions as well as other hospitals and other universities to try to build up you know this this ability to move data around and be able to see what's going on and be able to implement new technologies it's not just for the sciences or computer sciences but the humanities are an integral part of it and i think there is an extraordinary uh, synergy when you put Human, humanity scholar, social science scholar, computer scientist, chemist, and biologist all together. At Clemson, when I, in, in the past five years, go from uh, not being able to apply for research grants, not having the, the table stakes to get in the game, uh, Internet 2 has bootstrapped us to get into the game. But it, it, now that we're in the game, we have to look at how we can leverage and how we can uh, tap into these new directions that are out there. We're reaching not only across the university, and I think that transdiscipline work, interdisciplinary work is critical, and I think it is going to be the future in the kind of society that we are now. This is not to say that everyone has to do it, but that those who want to have the opportunity should be able to. Industry's moving fast. Everybody's moving fast right now. And as a standalone university and CIO, I can't count on myself to stay tapped into all those directions. It's through the collaborative environment that Internet2 provides that we'll be able to do that. So that's just uh, one example of the kind of case study we've been trying to put together to sort of make the case of, of why investment in, in this um, sort of innovation platform going forward makes the most sense. Um, so, so I've sort of talked through this slide here. Um, I, guess, I guess one thing to talk about is, you know, in terms of the future, you know, we can't predict the future. We don't know what the next Facebook or Google or um, Arbor Networks or whatever will be. But what we can do is say, what were the conditions in the past that have created an environment that spurred innovation? And then see if we can continue to construct those conditions spurring innovation going forward. Um, you know, I talked a little bit about the Facebook example earlier, you know, the, the, the dichotomy between the bandwidth of the pillow versus the bandwidth of the home when that, when that emerged. You know, the, the commercial approach tends to be limited bandwidth and availability. How full can you fill those pipes? Whereas the R&E approach has in the past, when we've been successful, been to make widespread bandwidth available. Um, excuse me about that, um, you know, to, to make that, that, that uh, bandwidth more than we think people need so that the, the innovative student can go out there and, and come up with a new way to consume all the bandwidth on the campus to do 
BitTorrent's probably not the right word, but <laughs> but but you know, come up with something that 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 will change how entire industries, like the music industry, works, or the books industry, or you know, whatever the next one is. Um, you know, an, another area to look at is how do real game-changing applications evolve? And there's a lot of effort now, you know, through Genie, through US Ignite, through, um, you know, a bunch of different other efforts to try to, how do we kickstart those next generation of applications? Um, you know, the commercial approach has been to look at small pilot demos with a short-term return on investment required, um, whereas the, the research and education's approach tends to have been more sort of widespread deployment in real user communities. Our campuses tend to be a really nice size you know, in the tens of thousands of, of students that are all willing to try new things. And it's not tens of thousands of people already set in their ways, but kids who are still trying to figure out where they're going. So again, if we can continue to offer that environment, we continue to create an environment for innovation going forward. A third area is that we need to worry about is how, how to make sure that innovation flourishes. Um, the commercial approach in the past has t tend to have been um, to let innovators play with sort of the current capabilities and sort of follow whatever the popular thinking is of the moment. Whereas the R&E approach has tended to been given an environment where they can kind of do whatever they want and don't really sort of judge, you know, whether it's worthwhile or not. Um, you know, some schools are starting to even create the technology incubators. I know University of Michigan and Ann Arbor, where I live, does, um, and I know many other schools out here in California do as well, where, you know, they create an environment where the kids can build new companies and try out new ideas and most of them fail but that's okay because you know every once in a while one of them breaks through and that's the one that really transform how things happen so you know in terms of the next US innovation platform um, internet 2 has started putting together as a community sort of figuring out what that environment was in the past how it's evolved to meet modern you know, modern conditions and sort of come up with sort of three basic pillars of innovation um, that, uh, you know, sort of we hope will create that next generation environment for uh, innovative, innovative development. Uh, the first one continues to be like in the past, although the numbers have changed, which is abundant bandwidth. Um, you know, if there is limited capacity, it's a major barrier to uh, anything more than just sort of incremental boosts in, in, the, in the current applications as opposed to just throwing so much capacity at it that almost any application that you could envision that's different from today is, is doable. So thanks to the funding from BTOP at the, at the national level, at the regional level, at the campus level, you know, the raw capacity available is now, you know, an order of magnitude bigger than it was just a few years ago and continues to grow. Um, so that's sort of the innovation route going forward. Um, and, you know, the, the, uh, you know, as I mentioned, over a billion dollars has already been invested into the RE community via the BTOP program. Um, you know, Internet 2's network is now 100 gig, 8.8 .8 terabit, uh, and basically nearly unlimited bandwidth um, to the community of innovators. Um, you know, many of the regional networks uh, have ARI, ARI grants as well to build 100 gig networks. Um, you know, we're partnering with Scenic to deploy a 100 gig optical network along the West Coast. So there's already a lot of work here, but that's a key piece of the innovation cycle. Um, the next one may seem like a new thing, which is around software-defined networking, but in many respects it's just getting back to the era where people were still building routers on campuses. If you, know, if, if, if you want to put a positive spin on it, what happened is those routers got commercialized and they got better and better and they have whole companies around them that are, that rose up and, and have made it, turn it into a black box. But, you know, just like there's still a appeal for that uh, VW Bug 1.0 that you could take apart in your garage and rebuild it, you know, there's value. You, know, you can't service your own car today. You know, in some sense, we have the same problem with network devices. And there's value in sort of blowing that back up and allowing people to do innovative new things while still keeping the performance that we've come to expect of those highly productized black boxes. So, you know, in my, from my point of view, software-defined networking, you know, in some sense it's narrowly defined as open flow, it's the interface between the control plane and the data plane, but really what it's about is opening up the network layer to innovation, letting innovators communicate with and program the network itself. Um, I'm actually a software engineer by training, not a network engineer, so in some sense it's kind of fun watching the network turn back into what I remember you know, in my days as a software developer, which is, it's just another programmable element. 
um, and allowing the net developers to optimize the network for a specific application, to create feedback loops, to create new network protocols. You know, so in some respects, what we're trying to do is create an environment where instead of needing, and I don't mean to offend anybody in the room, but instead of needing a lot of network engineers to run our networks, it would be great to have a lot of software engineers programming our networks. And sort of, that's sort of the, the, the evolution that we'll probably be going through through the next generation. Um, a you know, and, and in many respects, the r &E community is already driving the SDN innovation route. Um, you know, partners like Indiana University and Stanford out here in California um, have done, you know, great work in terms of driving that forward. There's a lot of collaboration I'll talk about a little bit more later in the talk with uh, the NSF Genies project. Um, and, you know, sort of setting the stage for a whole new generation of apps as the US Ignite project is sort of pushing towards. Um, so that's sort of that first component is sort of the ubiquitous bandwidth and the second component is sort of that software defined networking opening up the network stack. Uh, the third component is sort of science DMZ, and this is really a word that come from uh, the Energy Science Network. Uh, Greg Bell may have more to say about this tomorrow morning. Um, but, you know, ESnet's really been a driver in terms of the idea of a science DMZ. The way I think of a science DMZ is, uh, imagine you're about to build a new state-of-the-art research university, and um, I come to you and I offer to build your network for you, and you say, that's great. And, and I ask you, so what are you doing at your university? You say, well, I've hired all these great physicists and all these other scientists and biologists and medicine and everything else, so I'd love for you to build me a state-of-the-art network so my students can watch YouTube videos of cats on, on their cell phones, <laughs> which is essentially what we've basically done. Um, and, and so the, 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 the science DMZ idea is, is you know, Rather than trying to take a one-size-fits-all approach to network data flow, sort of the idea that we're going to herd all our mice flows and our cat or elephant flows into the same pipes, um, and really lack the right tools to do the performance monitoring of that and 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 customize them and optimize them, the innovation route we think going forward is to sort of separate those out to architect special solutions that allow higher performance data flows. Often at the times, perhaps they're willing to ex accept a more uh, stringent security regime in exchange for a weaker firewall, et cetera, um, to, to, to include end-to-end -end performance monitoring servers and software and um, to support programmability. But again, sort of that's sort of that third pillar of recreating an environment for innovation going forward. Um, and so this is uh, uh, built on some of the work that you'd find at fasterdata.es.net. Um, but, but, you know, sort of how do you create a science DMZ? And lots of folks are already starting to work on different parts of these. Um, you'll notice that, you know, in terms of key components here, there's this 100 gig connections, there's the SDN capabilities, and there's science DMZ. If you're in the middle of, if you wrote a successful CCNIE proposal last year, or if you're in the middle of writing what will be a successful one this year um, to get more network infrastructure funded, uh, you'll notice that that CCNIE program calls for things like abundant bandwidth, science DMZ, support for software-defined networking. So I think there's a lot of synergy between sort of what we're laying out here, what that program is willing to fund. Um, you know, there's the there's a lot of synergy with the NSF's funding of the Genie program over many years, what the US Ignite program is trying to do. Um, you know, and, and, and even smaller projects like the Dines Project, uh, the NSF also funded, sort of start creating these building blocks to create this environment for innovation going forward. Um, so, so, you know, the Internet 2 innovation platform, if you want to sum it up on one slide, it's that, you know, 100 gig nationwide infrastructure, it's a software defined networking, and it's a science DMZ. And so we have this program we've been calling sort of the Innovation Campus Program. Um, this is a picture that never shows up well, uh, but it does illustrate my point, which we need a little bit more over here on that, the left side of that map. Um, but basically what you're doing, uh, if you become an, in, an innovation campus, is you're signing up to do those three things by 2014. Figure out how to get a 100 gig connection into your campus, figure out how to start using SDN in your network operations, and figure out how to create a science DMZ to support big data to support the LHC project, to support genomics, to support climatology, or whatever it is that, that your professors are, are, are driving the, the state of the art in. And so what we're trying to do is to get critical mass across the leading research universities to do that. 
Um, and so the goal is, I think, to have at least two of those three pillars done this year, by, by June of this year, and, and, and three by, by the end of 2014. And we've had a lot of commitments from various campuses, and we continue to work with folks, and we're excited to work with you in terms of doing that. So, um, you know, in, in, in many respects, I built this slide, I think, a year and a half ago um, for a, um, either a Genie conference or the Open Network Summit, uh, where OpenFlow is being discussed. Basically saying, you know, the idea here is to say, to enable this next generation of applications, we want to blow up the stack, we want to create that ubiquitous bandwidth, and we want to, you know, enable big flows and little flows. And we are able to say that now. You know, we have a 100 gig test bed for innovation for tomorrow's internet available nationwide right now, and it is a playground for those innovators going forward. Um, let me stop here and show another little video, another use case here. Uh, this one is from Indiana. I think the innovation platform presents another great opportunity for the long-standing and mutually beneficial relationship that Internet2 and Indiana University have had together. And as a chief information officer who has to deliver the goods for our faculty and, and our researchers, uh, I just couldn't be more proud of the relationship and what we're doing together. Both the infrastructure providers here uh, and the folks at Internet2 have worked very closely together uh, in order to make these very valuable network resources available to a wide array of individuals. Indiana University was really pleased to be the first university to connect to the 100 gig network with uh, Monon 100. We see that as really instrumental to our work with software-defined networking. So we've been able to push and pull data from different places, uh, all for the goal of, of having people be able to uh, share that data, to collaborate using that data, and also to simplify complicated workflows. This is probably the first time data has gotten out in the front of population genetics theory and so the, the, the data generation has moved so quickly that we're lagging behind in development appropriate statistical methods. Uh, so this requires really high power computing. By increasing the bandwidth between two locations that means that you can push a lot more data from point to point. It doesn't really matter what the discipline is, if it's uh, big physics or astronomy or even our digital humanities. Our scholars care about doing their work. It's an amazing time to be a biologist, uh, especially an evolutionary biologist, because much of the theory we'd already developed, but it was just waiting for the data. So now to, to be in a time when we can merge the data with the theory is just a really exciting time. By being able to take this data that is so precise and capture all of it, we're going to be able to make discoveries that we couldn't even imagine five years ago. There's just been an insatiable demand for faster, better, cheaper, and more of it. Data is just exploding. Universities are great places for extremely high performance and high bandwidth networks as we enable students to start experimenting through software-defined networking or more apps that they may develop on their own. Universities provide the ideal test bed with the faculty, with the students, to develop what comes next. All right, last video. <laughs> um, okay, what, 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 what comes next? Um, so I kind of wanted to get into a little bit about what, on a concrete level, um, Internet2 is offering and what we would like to partner with the universities here in California and regional networks like CNEC to do. Um, so a little bit about sort of what we're offering and then I'll sort of go into sort of what we've been developing and how things have changed and they have changed radically over the past year. Uh, so Internet 2 essentially now offers layer 1 services, layer 2 services and layer 3 services although the line between the latter two is starting to blur as well. Um, you know in terms of our points of presence around the country um, it's a, a, a pretty, thanks to the BTOP funding and the work with the Northern Tier, it's a very rich map with lots of connections to universities around the country, as well as to, uh, th through exchange points, to uh, partners around the globe. 
Um, our layer two services continue to grow. Um, these are some of the nodes where we have or are in the process of putting in um, uh, switches at this point, 100 gig switches. Um, so one thing I should point out is that this is a heterogeneous network, which is uh, a, a significant change from what we've done in the past. In the past, Internet 2's networks were usually built with one vendor, and then a regional network would build a different vent with a different vendor, and a campus would build with a third. So as, as a community, we had a heterogeneous network, but each operator was working with a homogeneous network. So what Internet 2 is trying to do here is to, to really push the envelope in terms of the technology and the interoperability that we're, de we're demanding out of the vendors with the hope that the benefits from that will then trickle down to um, you know, the regionals and the campuses as well and make their job easier in terms of deploying whatever technologies are the best fit in the local environment. So I was talking earlier about the fact that you know, in terms of engagement with the vendor community that I've never seen it higher. Um, you know, in SDN in particular, um, we've been rolling out, this, this is an SDN enabled 100 gig network. Um, has been since October at 100 gig. Um, it's now, as of this week, a heterogeneous network. It's got brocades and junipers in it. Uh, we continue to work with Cisco and Dell and others as well, and I would expect that to continue to grow. We've developed a robust test environment uh, and, and begun sharing the results of that testing with the NTAC, that's the Network Technical Advisory Community, which I think some of you are part of. Um, and so the idea here is to really push the envelope with the vendors to say, no, we need these features, because if it's not the r &E community, if it's not the Internet 2 community, um, pushing for the wide area, multi-network um, you know, uh, environment, it's going to be driven by the needs of the data centers. And, and so we need to have our voice in there and really shape what SDN means. So uh, anyhow, so this is a, a mixed heterogeneous um, currently brocade and Juniper 100 gig network. Um, and then we have our layer three services as well, uh, which are uh, Juniper routers on top of them. So it, the overall effect is this is the combined infrastructure. So it's a total of um, 17 MX960s, uh, 21, some of those have, are still being deployed, uh, uh, 21 brocade and juniper switches, 250 or more amplification racks, about 15,000 miles of dark fiber, another 2,400 miles partnered with Zeo Communications, 8.8 .8 terabits of optical capacity, 100 gig uh, hybrid layer 2 and layer 3 capacity, um, and uh, built on the Sienna ActiveFlex 6500 network elements. Uh, and the idea is that this physical infrastructure allows us to create that innovation environment I was just talking about of abundant bandwidth, of avoidance of traditional bottlenecks, of programmability, and of performance monitoring to assure performance verification and do the debugging. So another thing that's sort of coming above and beyond sort of this basic infrastructure that I talked about here is sort of the idea of virtual networks. Um, and, you know, the Genie community has been experimenting with this for quite some time, as have others. But basically, the idea is to create slices across the network. Um, if you think back, I don't know, five, six years ago, you know, as a community, we tended to build multiple parallel networks, one of them being for commodity and one of them being for experimentation. And that, that, that's very hard to fund. Um, you know, does one subsidize the other or what? Um, but if you can, on a common platform, create an environment where our, our production services are running alongside our experimental services, that allows you to have that innovation component while also delivering the production component. And in, and in many respects, that's what we've started rolling out. So that Internet 2 Layer 2 service that I was talking about, it's 100 gig, it's SDN enabled, it's heterogeneous with multiple vendors. Um, it's also starting to run slicing. Um, so our entire layer two service, for instance, is running within a slice of an application called Flowvisor developed here in California at Stanford, now being developed by one lab, which I think is a collaboration between Stanford and Berkeley. Um, so we're running our layer two service within one slice of that. We're going to do this very slowly and carefully and as part of the community conversation, but the idea is to slowly open that up to more slices so that if you're, if you have an experimental controller, um, there will be a way, you know, with limited bandwidth but a nationwide footprint to run your own controller and to be able to um, 
start trying to do some of those innovative network builds. So we're going to go there very gradually. There's a lot of problems. I'm sure if we sat here in the room for an hour, you guys could fill the entire hour with all the possible problems we, we will run into and that we'll have to tackle as a community. But that's basically the idea. So a different way to look at it is sort of, you know, what's Internet 2's relationship with the Gini project? Um, today, um, the Gini project essentially has this Gini mesoscale infrastructure. And what they do is they use uh, Internet 2's ION service, which is part of our Layer 2 service. They use uh, maybe Dyn's nodes at a campus in regional, or they use a, a static Layer 2 VLAN in, in, into Internet 2 or into NLR uh, to reach that Gini mesoscale infrastructure. Um, so in a sense, it's a bunch of experimental islands interconnected by the production network. And so the goal here is actually to transform that so that, um, I don't know how fast this thing moves, instead of thinking of the network as how you get to the experimental infrastructure, it just becomes the experimental infrastructure. So we're trying to create an environment where we can offer the full Gini API um, into the actual Internet 2 network and, of course, into the